Everybody got in early last night, well rested today? Yeah. So at about 11 last night, I tweeted that I'm a just-in-time presenter and I'm still working on my slides. And then around midnight, I had this revelation. You know, the, the sort of the tagline of this conference is, this is an asynchronous conference. I'll just deliver my talk as a future and finish it next week. Problem solved. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, so yes, I uh, yeah, work for TypeSafe. You may be wondering why the word reactive is crossed out since uh, Eric Meyer told us yesterday that reactive is you know, dead. Kind of created a little dilemma. So uh, at first I thought I might say, well, the uh, paradigm formerly known as reactive. But uh, that was a little wordy, so I just figured I'd cross out the word reactive everywhere on the talk. The funny thing was I only found like 12 or so occurrences of the word reactive in my talk, so uh, it wasn't that bad. Maybe that's a meta joke, I don't know. But anyway, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, how some of our familiar design paradigms like object-oriented programming, DDD, et cetera, um, how they help us or don't in writing reactive applications. And then we'll survey a little bit of the uh, different styles of reactive that have emerged so far, like Rx and so forth. I'm a little disappointed there wasn't any heckling of the speakers yesterday, so I encourage heckling or questions. Um, you know, think of this as question time in Parliament, and I'm um, I just blanked. Oh, David Cameron? Or Tony Blair, if that helps. I know he was very popular towards the end. Anyway, I'm Dean Wampler. I write stuff. I work for TypeSafe. The slides are already at this pro Polyglot programming link if you want to bring the internet to its knees and a uh, tweet. Or I do this. Uh, this is a real book. It's on fishing. It's in the Harvard University Library, but uh, sort of the story of my life in some ways. Okay, a little disclaimer. It's kind of inevitable that uh, a survey talk like this is going to make generalizations, and I don't want to imply that one thing is bad, another thing is good. It, it all really comes down to skill at the end of the day, but um, what I want to do is talk about what I see as strengths and weaknesses of various approaches, and hopefully offend everybody at some point in the talk. And I swear this was uh, in my talk before uh, it was in yesterday's talks. So anyway, the four pillars of reactive programming. We've, uh, we've seen the four horsemen of the apocalypse already. We, had, we talked about those yesterday, so I thought briefly I would just summarize these because this is how I'll frame uh, the comparisons this morning. I basically took the reactive manifesto and removed all the big words, and this is what I ended up with. Um, first, it's all based on event-driven programming, right? Um, very asynchronous, uh, non-blocking is a key, um, and we want to focus on exchanging facts as events between subsystems. And also, a, it's a push notification model rather than a pull model. And the reason I use the word facts is to emphasize the idea that a lot of the distributed systems that have failed, many that Jonas talked about yesterday, a lot of times they failed because they really had too much information or they implied too much coupling between the, uh, the different systems, maybe versioning issues and so forth. So if we can keep things as fine-grained and as you know, focused to the point as possible, then that's, that's an advantage. Also, they need to be scalable. They should be loosely coupled. Uh, and that's the only way that we're going to actually be able to compose things together to create uh, big applications. And we also want them, um, well, they have to be distributed. So d distribution is not only essential these days for actually supporting the load that you might have if you're a Facebook in particular or somebody like that, but it's the only way to guarantee you know, very high availability because you know, a, a machine might be sufficient to handle the job, but if it crashes, then it's, it, you're still stuck. One of the interesting things that I think is, uh, now this is not a new paradigm, right? We're, I'm actually going to show you an example that's 20 years old of reactive programming, and it was actually called reactive programming 20 years ago. But one of the things I do think that's a little unique and innovative about the manifesto is that it calls out some things as first-class concepts that our systems need to support. And one of them is the notion that network problems, their strengths and weaknesses of networks, they need to be first-class concepts. Uh, we're not going to be able to, to scale unless we really appreciate the fact that there's a, you know, a time delay going over the network, that networks are unreliable, and that eventually things are going to crash or time out. And this kind of 
sort of reifying the known problems in the system is really an important idea that uh, permeates really all four of these. Responsive, well, it's a bit, I said must respond, that's perhaps very enlightening, but uh, the main thing is that you need to re respond at some point uh, to what, what's happening, now, even when errors occur. To the end user or to the client service, whatever, it doesn't matter whether the latency is long or the system is offline. It's basically the same thing, no service to them. So somehow we need to respond. And then finally, once again, reifying a concept that's very important, which is that failure needs to be a first-class concept and hence handling of failures. And we'll talk about in particular how some of these models do this very well, but others really don't uh, do it as well as they should. Okay, I actually made a lot of extra slides that I thought I wouldn't have time to go through, so there's a bunch of bonus slides, including several that go into these uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse in a little more detail, uh, but this is all I wanted to do for now. And what I'm gonna do is, for many of the slides, I'll put this little graphic up in the corner, and I'll color code it to sort of imply what I think as, you know, we're, we, whether the support is good, I'll, I'll use American colors. I don't know if they use these over here. Maybe, maybe they do. But anyway, green is usually like, go, it's good. Uh, yellow means that maybe there's some issues, uh, but it's not so bad. And red means there's some serious issues that have to be addressed if you're gonna use this particular approach effectively, as I see it. Okay. Well, I guess I didn't have the color codes up, sorry. Anyway, these are the color codes. So let's start with uh, programming paradigms, uh, you know, object-oriented programming and all that, because really these are the basis of how we think about problems. And of course, they're not sufficient in of, in of themselves. We have to write code that handles errors, that sends events and all that. But how do we approach the problem from, from first principles? And the first one we'll talk about is the old standby, which is object-oriented programming. And I'm going to argue that it's actually pretty good for handling the event-driven trait. It sucks for scalability and resilience, but it's okay for responsiveness. And hopefully some of you are offended already if you're big into OO, but... Uh, all right. Everyone's a little quiet. I know that maybe the beers are still kicking in, but anyway. Okay. Uh, one of the principles, and I'm not going to go through, you know, the entire thesis of what these uh, paradigms are all about, but just to highlight the things that matter from, from our point of view. One of the key ideas in object-oriented programming is that you should join state and behavior into cohesive units that we call objects. I think all of you probably know this. And that both has some strengths and weaknesses. It turns out that we sort of do this with the, the world as we perceive it. You know, we're... At, you know, at any given moment of time, we're receiving, you know, some untold number of, of uh, sensory inputs through our ears and our eyes and so forth, but we just naturally categorize things into blobs of some sort, uh, depending on the focus, the scope, and uh, we associate be behavior. Like, I assume all of you are going to eat lunch later and, and have already had coffee and that sort of thing. But there's actually a real drawback to this as well, and that is that we tend to build ad hoc representations of things, and then write lots of code to represent this stuff, and then we shove it into our system, and what we end up with is something that looks like this. You know, this is very sketchy, but it's very common to get this big wad of middleware that you can't tease apart into services that you could distribute, that you could replicate, and so forth. Uh, I've seen this so many times in uh, various client applications where they end up with this big map of the world, if you will, right in the middle of their code, and they can't quite tease it apart due to have like a separate payroll calculator and a separate, you know, insurance manager or whatever. So I think that, in fact, the biggest mistake that object-oriented programming made was this notion that you should actually implement your domain model. And this, is, this was considered such a great idea that none of us really questioned it for so long. And I certainly, for years, would you know, very faithfully implement the stuff that we were modeling in our domain. The problem with it is, I think, it's not the simplest thing that could possibly work. If you think about what that would be, it's, it would be, I'm just taking a wad of data, I'm passing it through some processing, and I'm spitting out another wad of data at the end. I don't really care if it's, you know, some person I'm representing or if it's, you know, some payroll or some tax thing. I just have numbers, and I'm just slogging numbers around. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do any of that, do any of the domain concepts in your model, I mean, sometimes they are useful, but when you actually implement code, I think it, it actually pays to distill it down to its essence, 
to understand that, yes, it's, it's good to have the same language from the uh, stakeholders who are telling you about your, what your application needs to do, all the way down to the testers and so forth. But in fact, there are drawbacks for any design choice. And having all of this information embedded in our code actually creates bloat, it creates inefficiency, and it impacts you know, the ability to scale because of the extra overhead. It makes it harder to tease apart services that we can distribute and run in parallel. And we'd be better served by just keeping things very focused. So I think there is a point where we as developers should say, all right, I understand the domain, I know how to talk to my stakeholders, but here's the computer science concepts that I, there are the minimal essential things that I need to do to make this thing work. Another major idea that's very prevalent in object-oriented programming is that it's okay to mutate state. It's actually a good thing. We, we send messages to our objects and then they, you know, transform the state in some way. And you know, once again, the idea was that we would encapsulate the logic of state and have this kind of uniform, uh, you know, sensible abstraction that we're exposing. The problem with it is, as we all know, is that when we run in parallel, suddenly we have this multi-threading problem, where if I'm mutating state at the same time in the same object from different threads, I have to do some nasty things to make sure I don't end up with inconsistencies. So, in fact, state mutation is a problem but it's not something that we should completely eliminate. I'm, I'll, I'll uh, come, go into that in a second, but going back to the four horsemen here, it hurts scalability if we're trying to run things in parallel, yet we can't reliably manipulate object state at the same time from multiple threads. It also means that we're more likely to have bugs, so that means that resiliency is more at risk. But it is a good way to represent uh, in general, object-oriented programming is fine for representing events because those are sort of domain concepts or even implementation concepts that we understand. So I do think it's a great match there. And then responsiveness comes into play here a little bit because, once again, if state mutation is a problem, then it means it'll be harder for us to guarantee service in the long run. So let me clarify what I mean by uh, mutation. We had a good discussion among the speakers beforehand about topics and... Um, you know, if you talk to uh, someone like Martin, you know, he's, he's obviously spent a lot of time developing, you know, very high performance, like lock-free algorithms and queues and things like that, where you are going to be mutating some block of memory for, for maximal performance. The advantage of mutation for performance is that you are going to um, basically not create copies, and copies can be expensive, especially in object-oriented languages where we've just assumed you should just mutate something and not try to keep it immutable. It turns out in the functional world, because as we'll see, they try to emphasize immutability, um, they've actually worked hard to make copying a very efficient operation, or relatively efficient. But it still is never going to be quite as fast as just, you know, slamming an array element or whatever with a new value. So the, I think there is a place that sort of fits into this picture a little bit of where mutation makes sense, but other places where it shouldn't happen. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is there's several layers of granularity that, where you could look at an application. At the top level, you just see a bunch of very coarse-grained services. You know, down below that, they might be processes running on different machines or the same machine. And then below that, you'll have modules, classes, or whatever modularity term you want to use, that are, are glued together in, inside these processes to do work. And I would argue that at the level of like, the processes, everything should look immutable. That's what the world should look like. But when you get down into modules, then it makes sense at, at times, depending on your needs for performance versus the safety of immutability, to do immutability hidden inside modules. So I think, you know, I don't want to say that immutability is bad, even though it has these downsides, because sometimes it is the right choice. But there's a, a notion of principled mutability, where we're strategic about where and how we do it, and the rest of the world looks immutable, where things are not you know, slammed at the, by the same thread, that they're you know, read-only so that we don't have to worry about multi-threading synchronization and all that stuff. And of course, unfortunately, at the bottom, we typically have databases where we're slamming the same record, and you know, they have obviously have a highly evolved mechanism of transactions for handling concurrent updates and so forth. But nevertheless, I think this is the right view for mutability, that strategically it sh you should aim for immutable code because that eliminates the problems of um, you know, thread coordination, but when it makes sense for performance, then have it nice and encapsulated inside a well-defined module. 
Well, so I said that uh, you know, object-oriented programming has its strengths and weaknesses as far as reactive uh, development goes. And I just noticed I forgot to cross out the word reactive here. So, jeez. Uh, <laughs> but let's talk about one that's actually 20 years old. Uh, I bought this book, AI Robotics, actually last week in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it has a chapter on reactive programming. And this, this book is 14 years old, and it was discussing stuff that was developed in the 90s. And it was basically a model of building uh, intelligent robots. Uh, I'm not going to go through a lot of details here. I actually wrote a bunch of slides for this that are in the bonus section, but realized I wouldn't have time to get through them. So let me just give you a sense of what this is illustrating. And what they figured out, uh, they used to write software in sort of a very monolithic way for robots, where you'd have this complex event logic, all, you know, big wad of code. You'd get sensory input, then there'd be some planning algorithm that was run to figure out the next step for the robot or whatever. And then it would act. It would uh, you know, invoke some action on the uh, servo motors that are driving it around or whatever. But they found that it was really slow to do this, because that, you know, that plan step took a lot of time. So they came up with this idea of separation of concerns, basically, where they would build some fundamental traits, sort of survival traits, like don't collide with stuff. And that's at the bottom of this picture. And the idea here is that if it comes up to anything where it can't make progress, it's just going to stop. You know, it's just a very naive response. Above that, they had a slightly smarter, if, if I can use that term, trait, which would be if it feels, and they, they use the term feel force, but if its sensors detect that there's an object in the path, then it just simply turns around and runs the other direction. So there's this runaway action that you invoke. But, you know, that's not terribly useful if the robot is constantly running away from things. What, what do you want it to do? Well, in this case, maybe you want it to wander some space and explore it. Maybe it's mapping some, you know, minefield or something that you want. So you want it to actually move around but still avoid obstacles. So you have this higher level abstraction of wandering. And if it detects that there's something wrong, then it, 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 it initiates maybe a smarter move. Like instead of running backwards, it'll try going to the side and then maybe turning at some other point. And the reason this is object-oriented, the way they actually implemented it was there's a tiny circle towards the right that most of you probably can't see, but obviously, you, the way I described it, you can imagine there's some competing actions that could happen. You know, like the runaway trait wants to send you back. The avoid trait wants to maybe do something a little less reactive, I guess, where maybe it turns to the side. So they needed an override mechanism. So the higher-level traits, if their actions conflict with the lower-level, traits, then they would veto the lower level actions, which is exactly what we do in inheritance when we override methods. You know, the, uh, the subclass method may actually do something that overrides the behavior of the base class. So they typically wrote object-oriented style code, or pseudo-object-oriented if they were using C or something, to do this. So, once again, as we've said before, reactive is not new. A lot of this stuff has been around for a while, and this is one interesting example, an OO example. Uh, from robotics. Now, it turns out, um, I actually didn't notice that the book was published in 2000 when I bought it, because I've taken some AI courses, and they, there's been some amazing advances in the last 15 years in AI that the book doesn't cover. But ne nevertheless, I thought this was an interesting model for how they uh, used to program this logic in a modular way and actually an object-oriented way. Let me conclude this section with a couple of uh, quotes from Alan Kay, who was the creator of Smalltalk and a very thoughtful guy about what object-oriented programming should be. For him, object-oriented programming uh, meant only messaging, local retention and protection, you know, hiding state process and so forth, and extreme late binding of all things. So he wasn't a static type person at all, he was more of a dynamic typist, as you might imagine, uh, being a small talk guy. Really, this is the actor model, quite frankly. I actually made up the term object-oriented, and I can tell you I did not have C++ in mind. So most of the object-oriented languages we're used to are really kind of in the C++ model or mode, and that's not what he had in mind. He had a much more dynamic system, much less coupling between objects, more cohesion inside than what we typically ended up with. Well, another approach that's sort of layered on top of object-oriented programming that really focuses more on the design is uh, one that you may, some of you may have actually used called domain-driven design, or DDD. And it's really sort of a system-level approach to object-oriented programming. So it focuses more on the upfront kind of design 
and less on specifying how you implement stuff. And I would say that it improves the picture a little bit, but I think it's also not necessarily what I would do. Let's put it that way. All right. So the first idea is that you should model your domain. And I actually think this is a good idea. I mean, we don't want to build the wrong system. We need to understand what it is we're building, what problems we're solving, and what's the most important things we should be doing, say, today versus you know, a month from now. The problem was that um, they just naturally made this assumption that I just slammed a minute ago that you should always implement the model. And I think that's where we get into all the problems that I just described. Although it does actually improve. So the only thing that's actually different on this, you know, bubbles uh, versus the last one is that I flipped resilient from red to yellow because they do actually have the notion of modeling error scenarios in, in DDD. So I think in that sense it's good because it makes you think up front about failure recovery, what could go wrong, and that sort of thing. There's a, um, an anti-pattern in domain-driven design called the anemic model, the anemic domain model to be specific. And I think the idea is that you don't want objects that are basically just state and you have external functions that are manipulating the state. You know, in, in most object-oriented languages, it would either be some struct kind of thing where there's no methods inside the class, but you have these static methods in your classes that are you know, manipulating that state. And this is considered a bad thing. But I'm going to claim that models actually should be anemic. When we get to functional programming, I'm going to make the claim that really it's actually better to separate state and behavior because it actually gives you better flexibility in how you manipulate things. I'll come back to that when we get to FP because there are some drawbacks to separating state and behavior, but I think actually it's the right way to go. Here's a bullet list for you. Uh, this is their terms for various kinds of objects. Um, some of them make good sense. I think at the bottom, it's, you know, factories are kind of a useful concept. Even uh, languages like Scala has that notion. Uh, we all need abstractions, or at least we think we do, for data stores. I've actually come to believe that object relational mapping is, is a ridiculous thing to do, that we should just embrace the, embrace the suck as sort of an American military term. But uh, uh, embrace the, the data structures that are coming back and not massage them into objects. Actually, you cannot do this in big data systems. You cannot afford the overhead of turning, like, rows of numbers into objects. It's just the overhead is ridiculous. But, you know, some things are maybe kind of useful, like domain events, so we're all about, you know, event-driven programming here, and there, here we have this concept. But the ones at the top I really hate. I have no idea what this entity thing sp is supposed to be. Stateless, defined by its identity and lifetime. I don't really know what that means. Uh, value objects, I think everything should be a value, meaning immutable by default. And aggregates, I think another mistake that we used to do all the time in object-oriented code is have some custom thing that represents like a list of you know, tax codes or a list of payrolls or whatever. No, I think we should just use our, you know, rich collection data structures like our lists and our you know, sequence, or sets and maps and so forth and not reinvent this, this wheel. So some of these terms I really dislike. I claim that a lot of these are poorly thought out and aren't as precise as they could be and that they should be replaced with better concepts from functional programming. And sometimes they emphasize the wrong thing. Again, we don't want to emphasize mutation of state, and we instead want to emphasize immutability because that's a safer way to program when we don't need the performance of mutability. I should say, too, I forgot to mention this earlier, that although it seems like it'll always be faster to just slam bits in a data structure, if you end up in a multi-threaded situation, the sort of locks that you might write around it and the other kinds of safety mechanisms you'll put in place can actually you know, override some of the benefits of that faster performance. So it's not always clear that mutable state is actually faster, although if you do it well, then of course it can be, say with a lock-free data structure. Now another concept in DDD is ubiquitous language, and this is really the idea that you should speak the same language with your domain experts that you speak down inside the code. And this does really seem like such a great idea because it means that everybody is communicating with the same terminology. Everybody is sort of on the same page, as, as, you, as we sometimes say. 
But once again, I think it's actually the drawbacks of implementing that language are, are overwhelm the benefits of doing it because we end up with stuff that's kind of baroque, it's kind of bloated, it's all tied together, rather than very focused to the point, the minimal thing that can possibly work. So I think in conclusion about DDD, I think it does do something very important, uh, which is to encourage our understanding of the domain, but do not implement the models. Instead, just implement the bare metal that you have to implement to get uh, the system actually working. And it's our job as developers to make that translation from the domain speak to the uh, computer science speak. All right, I've already been praising the merits of functional programming, so let me talk a little bit about why I think that's a, an important way to think about reactive programming. And I'm going to argue that it gives us the tools we need for all of these four horsemen of the apocalypse. Although, you know, you still have to implement, you know, event handling and all the other things we need. It doesn't just give you this stuff for free, but I think it gives us the right way to think about the problems. Well, it is based on mathematics or maths, as you say over here in Britain. In the, in the U.S., we say math because we're a little slower than you guys and we can only hand in one thing at a time. But, um, but really, so, you know, a lot of people don't like math very much. Many of you probably thought, man, this sucked when you were in school. And uh, a nice attraction of object-oriented programming, I think, personally, is that it is actually more intuitive for a lot of people. And I think that one of the reasons that functional programming may not go mainstream, even though it seems to be doing that, is because it is a little bit more mathematically oriented. It has that sort of rigor about it. And that isn't always attractive to a lot of people. But nevertheless, the value of mathematics is its precision. It really gives us a very crystal clear way of thinking about problems, if we're using the right math tools. Obviously, you can't just throw any bit of mathematics at the problem and expect it to work. But it does give us the sense of, of how things should operate, of framing the way that we uh, look at state and, and, uh, and stru even structure code in some cases. And so it helps really all of these areas by bringing that kind of rigor. You know, when you think about it, when you're doing event-driven programming, you're basically building a state machine. You know, each event sort of is a state transition. And uh, you can think about that mathematically if you want. Um, it turns out there's some mechanisms that make it easy to uh, really affect all the others as well, but I won't go into a lot of details here. One of the core pillars of, and th this actually ties back to mathematics, but the notion of composing behavior by composing functions. So here's the thing about object-oriented programming. Uh, you know, I have a little bit of gray hair, you may have noticed. So I've been around a little while, and I remember when it started, and, and you know, one of the big promises of OO was that it's going to solve our modularity problem. It's going to give us these reusable, composable modules that we can glue together. And it just didn't work. I mean, there are some exceptions. We, you know, certainly graphical toolkits kind of worked as uh, reusable, composable things. But there were people predicting that there would be like a new industry created of component you know, libraries that people would sell. And, and there were a few attempts at that, but it, it really didn't work. The reason it didn't work, and I think this is pretty fascinating actually, is if you think about what makes something modular and reusable, it actually really comes down to what are the fundamental protocols that actually make things composable. And it turns out that objects actually are, are at an abstraction level that's too high. My, my favorite example is that how many of you have ever worked in a company where your team had one notion of what should be in a person object? or customer object, whatever, and the, t and the guys in the next row of cubicles had another view of what they thought should be in it. So you get into these wars of, you know, what should, be, what should these things be? I remember working in a company a few years back, actually as a consultant, and they had these sort of high partitions along the hallways, and on one of them was a big UML diagram that someone had put up of whatever the hell they were building. And uh, they had this, it literally it was a person object, this was like an investment company, you know, for, for private investors. And this person object was the size of the wall, it had, you know, dozens of fields, dozens of methods, it was just a monstrosity. You know, here's some examples of modularity that's actually worked. HTTP, it's as stupid as it could possibly be, it's text-oriented, it has like, you know, eight or something commands, you know, get, put, that sort of thing. It's incredibly simple-minded, and people complain about it all the time, or at least they used to, about its simple-mindedness. It makes it hard to do sessions and stuff like that. But because it was so basic, it was just a perfect vehicle for building reusable components, namely web pages, and you know, the rest is history. Another fantastic example is digital circuitry. 
These are wires that have, they can say two things. They can say on or off, you know, one or zero. How could that possibly be useful? You know, that doesn't tell me anything. Well, it turns out when you stick, you know, 32 of them together, now you've got four billion different things you can say. And it turns out, you know, digital electronics, from an incredibly stupid, simple protocol, you know, is what it is. I mean, all these computers and stuff that we have are built on that incredibly stupid protocol. So the problem with object composition, uh, object modeling, is that there's no fundamental abstraction layer at the bottom of everything. And I want to argue that functional programming is actually giving us that abstraction layer, and that is, namely, very basic collections, sequences of things that could either be lists or maps, things that aren't sequential, like sets, because the order isn't guaranteed. And when you have these data structures over here, and then you have a bunch of operations separate over here, like, I want to add things together, I want to fold the elements together, I want to filter the elements, I want to group the elements by similar things, then suddenly you have something that I can apply these operations to this sequence, whether it's a map or a list or whatever, and it's actually better that I have separation of behavior, the functions, and state, you know, whatever the collection is. And this all comes about because of this notion of basing everything on functions and then having some fundamental collections on the side that you apply these functions to. And these little functions you can compose together. And I'll show you a really interesting example, I think, from the world of big data in just a minute. Now, there is one piece that's missing in most functional languages, and that is good modularity constructs. Um, all of them have something. Erlang has a really nice one, I think. It's just a very simple statement at the beginning of your Erlang, I think it's a module, where it says, these are the functions I'm exposing out of this module for public consumption. OCaml has a good module system. Scala actually uses objects as its modularity system. That technically traits, but basically objects. So this is something you have to fill in if it's not really provided by the core notions of functional programming. I've been harping on immutability versus mutability. If the emphasis is on a mutable state, then suddenly all of the multi-threaded concurrency issues go away. You just stop worrying about them. And that makes all of these other things just happen. It becomes easy to scale horizontally because you're not worried about a bunch of threads hitting the same data structure if none of them can modify it. And it makes errors less likely to happen, so resiliency is improved. Referential transparency is an interesting idea that if you have functions that do not have side effects, in other words, they only take what's input to them, work with it, and then return it, which is like, say, sine functions and tangents and all these things we learned in high school, then it turns out I could, if I know that I'm going to keep calling this sine function with the value of pi, I know that I can just stop calling it and just return the value of minus one, right? Yes. That's what referential transparency means. And also, if I'm not manipulating state on the side, then I can call this function anywhere, and I know it'll be good. And it's far easier to test these functions. So once again, I benefit all of the you know, removal of error and, and hence make things more scalable and more resilient. So really, I think that actually we should separate state and behavior, that it's actually a better model for these fundamental data structures that doesn't mean that you, don't, you eliminate objects completely. Scala, for example, is a hybrid language that supports both OO and FP. And what you find yourself doing, at least what I find myself doing, is I will implement some domain objects, like US addresses are a great thing to implement because you're going to have like a validation you know, method. You can take whatever garbage the user put on the, on, you know, the web form and, and turn it into a canonical format the post office understands. Zip codes are algebraic, it turns out. You know, they, they have to be numbers. And, and so forth. So there are some things where you, or cases where you might introduce traditional objects, but most of the time I find myself slinging data structures around. And maybe the things inside the data structures are little domain concepts. So it makes it easier to build systems like this, where we can have very focused processes that only do one thing, and I have a million of them because I need you know, to really be able to do this a lot during the day, and if any one of them crash, then okay, no big deal because I've got another million or so that are going to take over. The final claim I want to make about functional programming is at the end of the day, every piece of software we ever write is just a data processing system, meaning 
It's going to take in some numbers or some strings or whatever. It's going to manipulate them, and then it's going to spew out numbers and strings at the end. And if we think of it as a data flow problem, then a lot of the other stuff that we do is just extra ceremony that we really don't need to be doing. And let me just quickly show you one of my favorite examples from the world of big data. I used to do a lot of Hadoop consulting. One of the simplest algorithms that people implement the first time they get onto a Hadoop system is so-called word count. Whereas I'm going to read in a corpus of documents, I'm going to do this in parallel. You know, I've got like maybe one process per file. I'm going to tokenize it into words, and I'm just going to count the occurrences of all the words globally over that corpus of documents. So it's a very simple algorithm to understand, and so I can focus on the problem. Here's how I would do it in the Java API and Hadoop MapReduce. Uh, Maybe a few of you in the room can actually read this, because it's obviously a lot of code. In fact, it's only about 60% of the code. I left out the main routine. But there's just a whole lot of ceremony here that's related to manipulating Hadoop and, and other stuff. It's based on all the wrong abstractions. This is the same program written in a library called Spark in Scala, where it suddenly has collapsed to 10 lines of code, almost no ceremony for the ecosystem. There's a Spark context thing in there. But I, I highlighted in bold all of the verbs, the function calls. And even if you don't know this API, if you know a little bit about these functional operations that I was describing earlier, which we call combinators, you can pretty well get the gist of what this is doing just you know, within 20 seconds. I'm opening a text file. I'm going to split the, uh, each line into words and do a flat map, which is something you have to learn what that means. But then I'm just going to uh, group together all of those words and then count each of those groups. So it actually flows out very quickly once you understand these basic functional operations. And you don't have all this nonsense, noise uh, getting in your way. You know, the great thing about this program right here, it's basically a script. You know, it's, it's no longer a software engineering problem. I don't need a QA department to unit, or not unit test, but to acceptance test this thing. I don't have all of this software engineering process anymore. I just write this script, I test it locally, I deploy it in my Hadoop cluster. Whereas the previous program had so much crap going on that I really would not want to do that. I would you know, run it through the QA process or whatever to make sure it's good. The, the real point here is, for me, I think the most compelling argument for functional programming isn't that immutability helps with multi-threading. It's really that the world is basically a data processing world, and mathematics is the most logical way to think about processing data. So, I think that there's still benefits for uh, you know, object-oriented programming and DDD, but really the emphasis should be on sort of a mathematical approach, a functional approach to data. This is this Trump Tower that was built uh, near where I live in Chicago. It's now 90-some stories. It's the tallest residential building in the U.S. And really the point of this slide is that we, we need to go back to thinking about what the fundamentals really should be that we get right uh, and where we should get that right. What I mean is this. In OOP and DDD, we tend to focus top-down a little bit. We think about the domain, and then we dr drill down into objects. And it is important to understand the domain, as I said. Functional programming really starts at first principles, like what are the core data structures I need, and what are the core operations that are going to be universal across anything I build? And from that foundation, you build your way up. When they were building this tower, um, I would walk by this spot every now and then, and when they were drilling the foundation, actually the, um, the, the footers, I think they call them, they had these drill bits that were like 20 feet in diameter. That's, what is that in dog meters? Uh, it's about three meters. Um, no, that's wrong, about seven meters. Anyway, so they would uh, they'd drill these massive, massive holes in which they would pour concrete to uh, build this 90-story building. It's pretty amazing to watch. Okay, so that's enough about these paradigms. Uh, I need to press on here. Let's talk a little bit about some of these specific approaches to reactive programming that we've uh, maybe know about, maybe not. So I'll just quickly go through these and talk about where they're maybe strong and maybe weak in addressing these uh, four pillars of uh, reactive programming. And the first one is functional reactive programming, which is a really interesting model. It was invented as part of, a, I think, a doctoral dissertation, and it was really looking at the specific problem of how would I track UI events in a way that doesn't require a lot of callback logic and other things. And the idea is that you basically build up a data flow 
where I'm going to define variables that track something like, say, the position of a mouse. So I've got maybe a variable for the x position, a variable for the y position. And then I can define dependencies, like if I'm tracing out a, you know, a zooming across the screen, I might want to calculate the rectangle that I'm drawing. But I don't want to have to have a callback that's constantly right, you know, checking for wherever the mouse is and then or maybe getting notifications and then recomputing the area. I just want to have a function that will automatically track those changes like a data flow would. So as changes in the form of events come from the UI, then I'll just automatically update the area in this case. So it's a really nice deterministic, fine-grained approach. It's, it, it, it can run concurrently. And it's basically we're building a data flow system. And just to show you a little code, I won't go into a lot of details. This is a Scala version of what it might look like. I took this from a paper called Deprecating the Observer Pattern with Scala React. And I actually modified the example a little bit to make it fit more the way I thought it should look. <laughs> but anyway, you know, we can define this. The point is that we define something that looks like a sequential bit of code, but it's actually asynchronously running. We'll have a starting point where we capture the mouse down event We'll keep looping on events as the mouse is uh, updated and you know, uh, recalculate some position. I think in this case, I'm just tracing out the path is what the logic of this example is doing. And then when it's done, I'll just clean up and close everything and be done. So it actually, without going into a lot of detail, it solves a lot of the boilerplate we have with callback-based programming, including uh, cleanup and setup and so forth. So it's a very clean way to write something that looks se sequential, which we can all understand, but it actually is operating uh, asynchronously. And it's mostly been used for UI loops. The, a big drawback is it really is only single-threaded. It's designed to watch one sequence of events, and so if you want to have something that's like highly concurrent and distributed, uh, it's you, you have to so sort of massage the model a little bit. So. For that reason, I would argue that it's not so great for scalability because it really is kind of focused on a single event loop. But it does handle event-driven programming beautifully, very elegantly. It's responsive because it's a, you know, it's a push-based model. Whenever an event is pushed from the UI, I'll see it, I'll react to it, and so forth. But it also does not have any facilities for error handling. So that's one of the key things we said was important, right? Making errors first-class citizens. Well, it's missing here. But it does encapsulate mutation of state. You know, the position of the mouse is changing, but I don't have to write any code that you know, is basically bit banging. It's, that's all handled transparently by the system. But it is a single-threaded system, so it's a little bit not so scalable. Uh, Eric uh, Meyer talked a lot about Rx yesterday, reactive extensions. So let's look at that briefly. And the idea here is that we're going to you know, basically build up event-based systems again, in this case actually based on observers and observables, where we're going to, have, we're going to register callbacks and they will uh, get pushed events. One of the amazing things he implemented was this uh, language-integrated query or link that really gives you SQL-like ways of expressing operations you want to perform on an arbitrary collection, whether it's just a normal in-memory collection or a data stream like events and so forth. And that's one of the more compelling features of this thing is that, yes, I have a stream of events coming in from the mouse, but maybe I, I want to only filter for the ones that are actually within a window that I'm manipulating or whatever. And then they have this notion of schedules for uh, parameterizing how the streams are, are uh, managed concurrently. The picture looks basically like this, where we have this event stream, we have some observable setting in front of it that's uh, picking the events off the stream. And then through some mechanism like your observer logic or link, we actually can perform operations, these functional operations on data where we'll filter, we might map the events into something different, we might group them together and so forth, and then send them down to other processing. So I would argue that it's actually really good on... It, the, the three yellows maybe imply more negativity than I really intend, but it's, it's perfect for event-driven uh, programming. It doesn't really have a strong mechanism for error handling and recovery, although it has some representation for it. So I would say it's a little bit missing there for resilience. Responsiveness, actually, for the same reason. If you're not error handling and, and having a robust recovery mechanism, then it, you're going to be limited. And scalability, it's kind of oriented towards fairly narrow event streams, but you can sort of make it work for larger systems if you need to. What, what about if we just use callbacks by themselves? It may be hard to make out this picture. This is actually looking straight down a trail that drops into the Grand Canyon. So the back of the picture is like two or 3,000 feet below where I'm standing. 
But anyway. So here's what some uh, rather typical callback logic looks like. And one of the criticisms of Node.js is that it's callback hell because you write these complicated, you know, on complete kind of messages. This is just a made up example where it's actually kind of imperative. I'm saying, you know, when this event happens, then trigger something else, wait for it to finish, and so forth. Not really the way we want to do it. In fact, uh, here's an interesting set of statistics. Adobe said in 2008 that their de in their desktop apps, about a third of the code is devoted to event handling. As you can imagine, event handling is really important in something like Photoshop or whatever. And half of the bugs that are reported are in this code. So it's getting this right is actually rather important. And in fact, callbacks alone, without anything else, is pretty limited. There's a lot missing here. If we compare it, to uh, Rx, what's the real difference with Rx versus just uh, you know, naive callbacks is that Rx actually inverts the control. Instead of me sort of driving everything kind of indirectly through lots of uh, callbacks, in Rx we can actually specify how the stream should be processed. Eric made a big deal about this yesterday morning. I don't want to set up a callback for every little thing. I don't want to do pattern matching on every event that comes in. I just want to s declare that if you see this, then react this way. If you see that, then react this way. So it's actually a much more composable, flexible model. There's another model that's emerging called reactive streams. And basically, the picture here is that it's it's basically reactive extensions with one very key piece that's missing in reactive uh, streams, or sorry, reactive extensions, which is back pressure. So there's, so here's a classic problem. You've got consumers that are fairly computationally expensive. And you've got this very fast stream of events coming in, and the consumers are having trouble keeping up. So what are you going to do? Well, one way, one thing you might do is let the streams grow infinitely big. Uh, sorry, the queues, the event queues. Well, Martin said yesterday that's a bad idea, in part because you could run out of memory. You could fill up basically all available memory with this giant queue and then crash. So really, you want your queues to be bounded. But that raises another problem. So what are you, you going to do if the, um, if the stream is coming in faster than I can get events to the consumers, because maybe they're slow? Well, the trick is to have a back pressure mechanism, a feedback loop, where the clients tell the, the queue, the reactive stream, you know, how much you know, slow down a little bit or, you know, you send them to me in this rate or whatever. But it should also be out of band. So if it's, if it's in the same channel, then you're going to have problems where, like if, if the consumers here pushed an event to the end of the queue, that won't help very much because then you'd have to get through all those events just to see the message. So you'd like an out of band mechanism. And when you add this, then you do help responsiveness because you make, it, make the system more stable for you know, very fast streams, much less likely to run out of memory or crash because you've uh, uh, you know, exceeded the bounds of a queue, or you've had to drop messages. Another interesting feature, which I said I was going to use for this talk, but I guess I didn't, um, is futures. This is also the Grand Canyon. And it turns out futures are also a data flow model. And the idea is that I can put computation in these futures and then get the results later. And they can be synchronous or they can be in parallel. So this little example here, suppose that I, I have a giant matrix, n by n matrix of numbers, and I want to add all those numbers together. And let's suppose that n is extremely large, so I really don't want to do this on one machine. I want to do this over a cluster. So the logical thing that I might do to do it in parallel is I'll do each row. I'll add each row by itself, and then I'll take the sums uh, of, of each row, and I'll add those as a final reduction step. Well, it turns out I might actually use a future to get each row for starters, because maybe it's on a Hadoop cluster and there's a lot of overhead going to the file system. So I'll do that in a future, and when that finishes, then I'll do the sum of that row. And I can do those things in parallel, but they're all going to have to come back together to do the final summation in the reduction. So that's what I want to do here. And this is some sort of boilerplate Scala code to do it. There's some details I've left off the slide, but the gist is, starting from the bottom, well, I'll print the result when I'm done, but the function above it, there's a, uh, a, the equivalent of a static method in the future class where I can take a collection of futures and then I can, you know, piecemeal add them together or do whatever I want in this, anon in this anonymous function. Each of these futures is going to hold a sum, a, a number, a long, and I'm just going to add those together and, and slowly accumulate to the final result. 
Above that, I create this, this uh, collection of futures, a sequence, by just looping from 1 to n and calling some method some, some row. And the top function, some row, actually uses a future to first get the row. And then once the result is returned, once the future is finished, it maps the result, which is a row, into a call to the sum row method that is not shown that will actually do the computation. All right, I, futures by themselves, without anything else, are great for scalability because you really can run very, a lot of stuff in parallel. The only catch is if you have way too many futures and you have hardware threads, then some of them are going to sit there and wait a while. So it is good for responsiveness, too, because it lets us get work done and not be blocked on resources. We can go on and do other work while the futures are running. But by itself, it doesn't have a good error recovery mechanism, so we need something else. And it's... Um, it's, I say event-driven is yellow. It's not really specifically an event-driven model, but certainly you could have something on the front end that's taking events and shoving them into futures for processing. So that's, that's why I just colored that yellow. The last one I'll talk about is, is actors. And this is a very naive diagram, but basically the way actors work, most actor systems, is you have each actor is like an autonomous agent. It has some control over some state. It can manipulate that state any way it wants because it's going to run in a, in a single-threaded way. It will not be inter uh, you know, intercepted or, or uh, preempted. And it has a message queue. So messages are sent to the actor. They go to the bottom of the queue. I showed in the middle there that one actor is sending a message to another actor. And, and it doesn't actually write it to the end of the queue. I just sort of left out some middle bits there. But that's basically where the message ends up. And then one at a time, the actor pulls the messages off its message queue, its mailbox, and processes it. So I can nicely encapsulate state. Uh, you know, I can, like one of these actors might be writing to my database. Maybe I do all writes through, this, through a one actor, so I'm not having concurrent writes. Actor, the actor model, one of its real great strengths, this is something Erlang created and, and Akka has, has uh, copied, is a very sophisticated error recovery mechanism called supervisor hierarchies. So I've got my worker actors that are doing all this, you know, like summing matrices or whatever, and then I've got these supervisors that are watching what are going on, and they're, they're managing a bunch of actors. And if one of them fails, I want to immediately tear it down and maybe restart that actor so that we don't and we keep making progress. Or it may be that if these actors are all working together, I might have to tear down the whole tree of actors and then rebuild it. And the supervisors do this. So it's an extremely powerful, flexible, and pretty easy to use model for error handling. And for this reason, I think that the actor model is, of the, these uh, reactive models that we've seen, I think is the strongest at meeting the needs of all four of these things, because it has a strong error handling recovery. It reifies errors, in other words. It reifies the notion in a distributed actor system of all of the issues with network programming. Um, it's, it can be event-driven, although we're talking about message sends, certainly those messages could just be uh, events. And hence, because it's also running in parallel, distributed, non-blocking way, where each actor is doing its own thing, but, uh, but other work can continue, it's also responsive. So to wrap up, I just want to give you a couple of quotes that actually don't apply to Reactive per se, but they've kind of really influenced the way I think about software design for the last few years. And the first one by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry is, perfection is achieved not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to remove. He was talking about writing. Uh, Mark Twain once said, um, I didn't have time to write you a shorter letter, so I wrote you a longer one instead. It's the same idea that we really need to distill our code down to its essence. What is the minimal thing that could possibly work? And Einstein said something. So, woo, glad I'm done. Thank you very much, and I uh, hope you have a good conference. And this is my cat. Thank you very much, Dean. Thank that was you. awesome. Thanks. Thank you.